Chapter 1, A Dark and Snowy Night Night winds moaning in corners and whistling through the cracks dashed snow against the windows of the Meadow View Inn. Inside, a fire crackled in the snow, the stone fireplace. The grandfather clock, as old and as tired as the inn itself, marked the passing of time with a slow tick talk that seemed to say, Wait! Ing! Wait! Ing! Everyone in the lobby was waiting. The desk clerk, the handyman, old Matt, who also carried guest luggage to the room, Ryan Bramble, the son of the hotel's new housekeeper, and Ralph, the mouse who lived under the grandfather clock. The desk clerk dozed, waiting for guests who did not arrive. Matt leaned against the wall to watch television while he waited for the desk clerk to close up for the night. Ryan, sitting on the floor to watch television, waited for his mother to tell him to go to bed because he had to go to school the next day. Ralph crouched beside Ryan, waited for the adults to leave so he could bring out his mouse-sized motorcycle. Unfortunately, Ralph's little brother, sister, and cousin, hiding in the woodpile and, and behind the curtains, were also waiting. On the television set, a sports car crashed into a truck, shot off a cliff, and burst into flames. Wow! Without taking his eyes from the touch screen, Ryan said, There's a boy at school named Brad Kirby who would really like this movie. He had a BMX bicycle for motocross racing, and his father sometimes drives him to school in a tow truck. A police car followed the sports car over the cliff before Ryan added, Brad isn't very friendly to me. He's sort of a loner. Ralph was more interested in television than in Ryan's problems, and if I had a sports car like that, he said, I wouldn't let it run off a cliff. Ralph was an unusual mouse. He had listened to so many children and watched so much television that he had learned to talk. Not everyone could understand him. Those who could were lonely who shared lonely children who shared Ralph's interest in fast cars, motorcycles, and who took the trouble to listen. Other children, if they happened to glimpse, Ralph said, I saw a mouse that squeaked funny. Matt was the only adult who understood Ralph. Yes, sir, that mouse is a mouse in a million, he often told himself. Ralph knew that there were not really a million mice in the end, although he had to admit that in wintertime, the mouse halls were crowded because his rough outdoor relatives moved inside to keep warm. Ralph's mother said that they were a rowdy bunch that set a bad example for the more civilized indoor mice. While Ralph and Ryan were enjoying a commercial for a truck that could zigzag overturning, Matt strolled into a room, called the Jumping Frog Lounge, and returned with a handful of popcorn. He dropped one kernel in front of Ralph. Thanks, said Ralph, who enjoyed nibbling popcorn while watching television. As the commercial ended, Mrs. Bramble entered the lobby. Come on, my boy, she said to Ralph. It's past your bedtime. You know the manager doesn't like you hanging around the lobby. Aw, Mom, just let me watch the end of the program, pleaded Ryan. I'll leave it. I'll leave if any guests arrive. At that moment, the rattle and crunch of a car with chains on tires were heard. Ryan roused and walked backward out of the lobby so he couldn't miss the high speed. So he wouldn't miss the high-speed, siren-screaming chase on the television screen. As he left, he gave Ralph a little wave with his fingertips, a wave no one else could notice. Ralph wished Ryan could stay up all night like a mouse. As the car stopped in front of the hotel and the desk clerk roused himself, Ralph scurried under the grandfather clock to the nest. He had made from chewed-up Kleenexes a lost ski lift ticket and a few bits of carpet fringe he had nibbled off when no one was looking. Besides, his nest rested, into, rested his two precious possessions. Precious possessions. A little red motorcycle, a crash helmet made from half a ping-pong ball lined with thistle down, gifts of a boy who had once stayed in the hotel. Above Ralph, the clock began to rind, grind and groan and strike, bong, bong, as if it had summoned strength from each stroke. Ralph dreaded that sound, even though it was the reason he lived under the clock. The noise terrified his little relatives, who thought the clock was out to get them. As long as they feared the clock, Ralph's motorcycle was safe. The car door slammed. Feet stomped on the porch, 
When Matt opened the door to let two people blooming into the lobby, a blast of freezing air sent Ralph's nest swirling around in bits. Never mind, thought Ralph, peeking out of two pair of boots, the kind known as a waffle stomper, which had trick treads, thick treads that held snow. Do you have a room for the night? The owner of the larger boots asked the desk clerk. Hmm, let's see, murmured the clerk, who always behaved as if the hotel might be full even though he knew it was not. Stop pretending, thought Ralph. He was tired of waiting. Well, the desk clerk ended the suspense. I can let you have 207. Just fill out this card, please. Ralph's keen ears heard the scratch of a pen and the rattle of a key, and he winced when the clerk bump banged the bell on the desk for Matt, even though Matt was standing right there waiting to carry the guest back. Never mind, said one of the guests to Matt. We can find our room. The pair picked up their luggage and stepped into the elevator, leaving behind puddles of melted snow. Cheapskates, muttered Matt. Guests at this hotel often insisted on carrying luggage to avoid tipping him. After the elevator door closed, Ralph worried that the puddles might dry before he had the lobby to himself. Time dragged on. The man in the red vest who worked in the Jumping Frog Lounge came out, yawned, and remarked that he might as well close for the night. The television station went off the air. The, dirt, the desk clerk locked the front door and left. If any more guests arrived, that would have to bring the night bell. Matt began to turn out the lights. At last, Ralph threw his leg over his motorcycle, adjusted the rubber band that held his crash helmet in place, and grasped his tail so that it would not become tangled in his spokes. Then because as everyone knows, a toy motorcycle moves when someone makes a noise like a motorcycle. Ralph took a beep, deep breath and went and shot out from the clock. Gradually he picked up speed and zoomed through a puddle. Wings of water fanned under front, out from his wheels. It was a thrilling experience. All of Ralph's little brothers, sisters, and cousins, hoping Matt would not notice them in the dim light, popped out from their hiding place to watch. Of course, Ralph had to show off. He took deeper breaths and rode faster, making puddles splash higher and leaving tiny tire tracks on the dry linoleum. Matt, who was banking the fire from the night, laid down the poker to enjoy the sight. Unfortunately, the little relatives were not satisfied. Not now. Once Ralph's indoor relatives had been happy to have Ralph push them up and down the hall on their motorcycle, but this treat was not enough for his rowdy outdoor relatives. They wanted to ride the motorcycle by themselves, so now all the mice wanted to ride. They came running and jumping across the thread threadbare carpet to the linoleum squealing. I want a ride. Give me a turn. Come on, Ralph. Get off. Let us use it. Ralph started to whiz around in a figure eight when his tires slipped and the motorcycle tipped. He lost control and landed in icy, dirty water. The daring outdoor mo mice waited out to grab the motorcycle, but Ralph was quick. Dripping and shivering, he sprang back on the seat and rode off. Avoiding clutching paws, if only he could make his relatives behave. Go away, you're too little, said Ralph, thought chattering teeth as he swerved to miss tiny toes. You would forget to hang on to your tails, and you'd get them tangled in your my spokes. He tried to wipe his nose with his wet paw and wished mouse children had to go to bed at night like human children. We would not, the rougher mice grabbed the motorcycle and brought Ralph to a halt. You're not so big yourself. You fell down. All the mice began to complain. You let us ride or we'll tell your mother on you. She said you were supposed to give us a turn. Cousin Closet to Cousin closest to Ralph is in age said it wasn't fair for Ralph to have a motorcycle. Nobody had even given them motorcycles and then they were just as good as Ralph. Some of the meaner mice told them told him their mothers said Ralph was spoiled and selfish and would probably turn out to be no good when he grew up. Ralph was hurt. I'm not spoiled and I'm not selfish, he insisted as he tried to drag him his motorcycle away from all those clutching paws. In his heart, he did not feel selfish. 
He only wanted something that was his that was his alone. A mouse so barely so rarely had something he could call his own. You're greedy, said a cheeky outdoor mouse. Then all the mice, down to the littlest one, who was tangled in the fringe of the carpet, began to chant, Ralph is greedy, Ralph is greedy. Ralph finally lost his temper and squeaked at the top of his voice. Beat it, you little rotten rodents. Try and, ma try and make us, the outdoor mice were defiant, but Ralph could tell that they were not as brave as they pretended. Shocked and hurt by some strong language, the little indoor mice felt silent. They looked at Ralph with such sad eyes that Ralph was ashamed. You said bad words, said, little, said one, his voice filled with reproach. I'm going to tell on you, said another. My mother won't let you talk, wouldn't let you call me those words. Ralph felt terrible. Oh, come on, he said. It's just that my motorcycle's wearing out. The tires are thin, and if you wear them out, where am I going to get another pair? The little mice would not accept this excuse. We've never had a motorcycle at all, one of them said. I know, but began Ralph, not knowing how to finish. It was not his fault his young relatives did not have motorcycles. Still, he had used by, he had used language too strong for little ears. He was not only trying to make his pack of pushing, shoving, grabbing relatives behave. Matt must have understood Ralph's feelings, for he come to his rescue. Shoot, he said loud enough to frighten little mice, but not loud enough to terrify them. The words sent them scrambling back to their hiding place. Thanks, said Ralph. Thinking, Think nothing of it, Matt gave the fire one last poke before he returned for the night. He left the rapid drying puddles for Ralph, who took another turn through him, them. Although water still fanned out from the wheels, somehow the fun had gone out of riding for that night. Wearily, Ralph pushed his motorcycle back to the cave under the clock where it was safe. Even though he was wet and numb with cold, he loved—he lovingly wiped mud and paw prints from his chrome spokes with bits of shredded Kleenex. When he began to wipe his exhaust pipes, he discovered that, wiggled, loosened by all those turning paws, tugging paws, the rear wheel shock absorber was loose too. When Ralph had wiped all of the mud and had polished his chrome, he rumbled through the remains of his nest for a bit of carpet fringe. Unfortunately, it turned out to be too thick for trying, for tying his exhaust pipes in place. He felt worse and worse as he began to groom his damp fur. His tires were so thin that he no longer wanted to risk the wearing, wear of riding them on the rough surface of the carpet. His mo motorcycle was zeroing out. None of his relatives liked him. They were going to tattle on him. In the morning, his mother would venture downstairs to lecture him on the evils of selfishness and bad language. She would also lecture him on his duty to set a good example for the little mice. Ralph pushed his nest together again. I'm a bad mouse, he thought, filled with gloom and guilt. I'm a rotten rodent, not my relatives. As he climbed into his nest and curled up his tail tight around his body, he wished he would leave the mountain view in so he would never have to face them again. But how could a mouse leave in winter when there was no snow on the ground and wind howled? He would freeze, starve, or he'd blow away, or all three. Ralph shivered and pulled his tail more tightly around his body.